Hi guys, how are you? My name is One Titanium. Welcome back to Real Macro Economics and Investing. Patreon.com slash Real Macro. Come on down and subscribe. Don't forget to like and subscribe the video. All right, so we're going to talk uh, a little bit about economics now, and I'm going to start answering some uh, questions. And the way I'm going to go about it, um, first, before I, I continue, I, I just want to make something clear that it's easy for me to convince somebody that uh, airline stock prices are based on traffic, okay, passenger traffic. And when you see the passenger traffic fall off, it is very easy to see that the stock prices fall off, right? That makes sense. I can convince anybody of that. But when I apply the same logic to, to, to economics in the real world, for some reason, people can't get it. <laughs> then uh, politics comes in. I read this from this person, and I heard that from that person, and this book said this, and uh, I don't know anything about that. Forget about that. I am telling you that there is a, a value and there's price. Okay, Price is an advertising mechanism, and then there's value, the value of something. So let's go back to the Philippines. Okay, Philippines is 110 million people population. From this 110 million people, do you know how the economy is actually measured? It's measured only by 16 million people. The rest are almost non-existent. So let me give you an example. If you look at here, you can. this is per household. We'll skip this one. We'll go by the number of people. The middle class is defined as anybody who's making anywhere between a thousand and fifteen hundred dollars. There's about eleven million of them. Anyone who's making about fifteen hundred dollars to about three thousand dollars per month is about three point eight of them, three point eight million. And then anyone who's making about three thousand dollars to uh, roughly uh, what is that four five let's say five thousand, okay per month, there's only a million of them. So right there, you can see it's about 16 million people, right? Anyone who's making less than $1,000 is considered lower income. They don't even really register on uh, the economy. So think about that. That a size a third of the United States is, the entire economy is based off 16 million. That's crazy, right? Less than, what, 12% of the population? So remember, when you are looking at an economy, you are only putting a thermometer, okay? You're only putting a thermometer in the portion of the economy that's, that's functional. Anything that's not functional, forget about it. So if, if the productive functional economy shrinks, then the rest of the people, don't, they don't count. Forget about them. They're not even a part of it. So for example, you'll see now that unemployment is down to 6.9. Is it really? No, it's not right? It's just that people fell off of the uh, being counted list. That's it. They're not being counted. Long-term unemployed. Fuck them. We only want to measure the portion that's working. And I understand that. I do. I get it. The, the, they're only worried about, we want to see if things are starting to bottom out and what's left of that economy. Okay. So when you look at short-term uh, economic data, what you're going to see is, oh, look, there's a V-shaped recovery. Oh, look, there's this. Oh, look. There. Yeah, but that doesn't mean anything. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going back to where you were. So let me show you uh, an example. Forget about the politics. Forget about that this is about COVID and so forth. But you can see that the isolator was showing a very high um, uh, infection rate. Okay. But that was on a relatively low number. We're getting the same kind of spike here, but look how far, how much higher you are, right? It's the same thing here, right? With deaths, the same thing. So this really doesn't tell you anything unless you are looking for uh, perhaps a bottom, uh, uh, if you're looking for a top or something that is just monitoring the rate of change. But that in of itself is not telling of what's really going on okay what's really going on that's what you care about you care about what's really going on okay this is vastly different points vastly vastly different points okay 
vastly different. So you need to understand that. Now, the incubator economists, the permabulls, they're going to show you one thing. They're going to say, oh, look, 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 look how great this is. Look how wonderful it is. This is great. Yeah, but <laughs> but look at this. It's not the same. No, no, but look at it. Uh, it's like, no, 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 no. Not the way it works. So just to kind of drive home the point. So from the 16 million that the whole entire country is measured by, if it were to shrink to 12 million, okay, the economic data would still show an improvement if it went down to 10 and then improved to 12. It's not the same size. All this has been disregarded, okay? It's still going to show you improvements, but it's not really showing you what's really going on in the economy, okay? And this is not to, to make fun of unemployment rate. It's, it, it serves its purpose, but the purpose is not to tell you what's really going on in the economy. So let's go back in time and let's look at 1947. We had a GDP of 103. Corporate profits were around 9%. And the S&P 500 to GDP was about 37. Okay. Let's fast forward till today. Today we're 130% debt to GDP. We have the S&P uh, market cap to GDP of 172. And corporate profits are around 10%. And the 10% is prior to COVID, okay? Now it's half of that uh, or something like that. But you can see that there's a big difference, right? So what's what's the most noto noticeable thing? Well, the most noticeable thing is that we were net exporters back in uh, 1947. Today, we are net importers, okay? Consumption, was a, uh, consumption to GDP was about 64%. Today, we are at... 68 percent so let's go back in time to 1970 okay in 1970 we had a debt to gdp of 35 percent s p market cap uh, to gdp was only about 51 percent and corporate debt uh, was about five percent of gdp we were still barely net uh, exporters but government was much larger. It was about 24%. Consumption was, uh, as a percentage of GDP was all the way down to 60%. All right, so now let's go and analyze the Philippines, okay? We understand the population is 110, that 16% make up the, the economy. What was the growth rate? Forget about COVID, but what was the growth rate of the Philippines? Very high, somewhere between 4 and 6%. Uh, of GDP going all the way back to 1988. Okay, so they've been growing, but they've been growing from zero, right? They've been growing from a very low level, but nonetheless, they have been growing, and that's, that's important. What about the unemployment rate? Well, up to 2006-07, the unemployment rate was quite high, right? It was up around 10-12%. And then after the great financial crisis, suddenly what happened is there was a very big drop in unemployment, right? And everything started to uh, to fall. It went all the way to about 4 or 5% of GDP. Forget about COVID. But you see the improvement uh, in the unemployment rate. So definitely there's been some kind of improvement in the way they run their economy. Then you look at their inflation rate. So the economy is growing at a rate of about, let's say, 5%. And yet, when you look at their inflation, their core inflation, it's under 4%. It's about 3% average. Okay. Now, that, that tells you something, right? That the economy is really growing. It's really actually, it's not being stimulated by nominally pumping in uh, pesos in their case. Okay. It's a real growth. When you look at normal inflation, not core, normal inflation, then you end up with the same kind of scenario, something between 2 and 4%. So again, you have an, an economy that's growing 5 to 6%, you have an inflation rate of between 2 and 3%. This is fantastic. What about their foreign reserve exchange? Foreign reserve exchange has been growing uh, very nicely. Okay, it kind of plateaued a little bit in uh, after the great financial crisis, but since then it has continued to increase. Right, That strengthens the currency. Right, that, that strengthens the peso. What about their interest rates? Well, the interest rates, this is global phenomenon. They've been falling. Uh, but again, you, you're seeing that it's nothing crazy, right? The interest rate is, is pretty tame. So that's good. 
what about the current account? Well, current account is positive. Anything above zero is positive. Right? So that's doing good. Okay? That's doing very nicely. How about current account as a percentage of GDP? Right? That's doing good. Right? Anything above zero, right, is positive. So they're not printing, borrowing, and importing. Right? So you can see the improvement. You can see the quality of the economy. What about their uh, debt to GDP? Well, since 2004, debt to GDP has been falling. Right? So they're reducing their uh, public debt while growing the economy at 6% with low inflation, okay, this is, a, this is a, an ideal, almost perfect economy. What about capacity utilization? Again, forget about COVID. We don't care about COVID, okay? Uh, what was it? It was nearly 85%. So the industrial output was, uh, the factories was about 85%, which is very good uh, a number. Uh, again, you know, low inflation, high GDP growth, Right, high productive uh, uh, capacity to utilization. So when you go back and you look at the stock market, right, and again, forget about COVID, what you're going to see is a very nice rise in their stock market, and justifiably so, right? They're doing a lot better. Um, they ended up with COVID, and you know, it cracked like everything else. But you can justify the growth in the economy uh, of the Philippines. Well, what about the currency? Well. You'll be surprised that uh, in, their, in their currency markets, they've actually improved uh, over this um, uh, uh, this period. Okay. Now, granted, back in 2012, uh, 13, there was a low, but that had to do more with dollar strength than it had to do with Philippine weakness. Okay. Um, the, you know, obviously the dollar went from 0.71 all the way up Battery to low. 100 to whatever, but you can see that, you know, th there was some kind of devaluation in the peso, but again, it's dollar strength and the devaluation was not extreme, I would say. Okay. You look at it now, since 2017 till today, the peso has been improving against the dollar. So you got a very good economy it's growing granted from zero it's only 16 million people that are growing but that's the point isn't it that when when you have 16 million or let's say it was 12 million and then 13 million and then 14 and then 16 million eventually it's going to be 20 million and 25 million it's going to become the middle class is going to become a bigger portion of the economy there's a lot of growth there there's a lot of good sound growth uh, again, you look at the GDP growth rate versus inflation. You, you know, you look at all the matrix, and it's you know the, the economy is doing fantastic. That's a that's a good economy. It doesn't have to go straight up every day. It doesn't have to be perfect every single year. It can go through its down years, but overall net, it should be growing. That is not the way the U.S. is behaving, right? So I view the the. Uh, the Philippine economy is something like we were in 1947, right? 64% of GDP was consumption. We were net uh, importers, I'm sorry, exporters, right? Government wasn't a very big part of the economy. Corporate profits were good. Uh, S&P uh, versus GDP was 37%. Yeah, we had high debt, but things were improving. More so in the 1970s, okay? Not that their government is as big uh, as as um, uh, as it was back in the 70s, right? But the consumption was there, about 60%, which was on the low end, right? Debt to GDP was 51, right? The, in Philippines, it's, it's decreasing, right? Corporate profits were good, right? Debt to GDP, you know, everything that it used to be in the U.S. in the 70s and 47 and so forth. Nothing like it is in recent times. Nothing. You can't even compare one with the other. So why all this stuff? Why all this 14 minutes of talking about Philippines and everything? I want to show you that there's limits to economies. There's always limits to economies. No matter how high they go, no matter how great it's been, you can't say the, the same thing is going to happen. Just because the stock market has always gone up doesn't mean it will continue to always go up. And, or, and if it does go up, it, then it will go up for the right reasons. 
inflation will make the stock market go high, right? But it doesn't mean that you're making money. So as a, as a quick rule of thumb to think in your head when you're looking at economy, right? How big is an economy? What's the population, right? What's the age of that population? Where are the peaks and valleys in that demographics, okay? What percentage of that population is middle class, right? What kind of an economy is it? Is it a consumer-driven economy or is it a producer kind of economy? So, for example, if you compare Turkey to the Philippines, Turkey is a print, borrow, and import economy, right? Consumer-driven. But that's not sustainable. As a result, you've seen what? That the currency has collapsed. Compare that now to the Philippines and you'll see a very nice, steady economy. It's not the same thing, right? Not even close. Um, you look at the... Uh, at the quality of the economy. What are they producing? Are they like Singapore? Or are they like, um, you know, I don't know, Burundi, <laughs> right? What quality? is it, uh, Are they making cheap plastic shoes? Or are they making satellites, right? There's a difference. So the, the quality is, is the next thing that you want to look at. Uh, as a rule of thumb, I, I, I go to malls, and if I, like, for example, in, in Dubai, any mall you go to, you're going to see a Rolex shop, right? You go to the Philippines, you're only going to see it in casinos. You're not going to see it out <laughs> in the everyday uh, economy, right? So you can see the um, how, how that kind of makes sense, right? And then you look at the private debt. You look at the private debt of that economy. Is there room for them to expand their private debt? And if there is, chances are, at some point, that private debt will grow. And when it does, that's going to pump money into the economy, and that economy is going to explode. Okay? Um, let me give you an example of the Philippines. Right now, you can go buy, in certain areas in the Philippines, uh, real estate, and you'll make a lot of money. Now, often what happens is that the real estate becomes so expensive that there, the, the, there comes a detachment between the, the normal class, the vast majority of the people, and the price of a home. You see that in China. You see that in the Philippines. You see that in Vietnam, Cambodia. You see that in a lot of places. That's a natural, normal phenomenon. Uh, I, I would add, you know, there's so many things you can add to this, but, you know, the, the government intervention, how much of that is positive? For example, you look at Dubai, right? Uh, Dubai became an overnight sensation, literally in, in a very short period of time, became an overnight sensation. Why? Well, they didn't have taxes. Why? Well, because they're a net export in a very rich country. Well, what about their politics? Well, they wanted a nice big city, and they wanted uh, a good class of citizens. So they paid expats well to come into a region of the world that had a lot of growth. So they invested... Let's take the Burj Khalifa as an example. So they invested in the Burj Khalifa, okay? And, and let's just pretend the government just, you know, put it up. They spent half a billion dollars producing it, right? They had to bring in engineers, construction workers, whatever. Once Burj Khalifa was created, now you have, I don't know, a thousand apartments you can sell. You sell them for an X amount of dollars, and now that building, right, is going to be worth one billion dollars and it's going to require restaurant owners chefs right uh hostesses um dishwashers pool guys uh, exercise uh, fitness gurus uh it creates an economy right that creates a lot of jobs maintenance people they're going to sustain it so that is real growth you're going to attract people to come into that uh, area of the world that are going to want to own uh, a piece of that building, whether it be for, you know, because it's the tallest building in the world or whatever the case may be. They, they want to leave the UK and be in the sun. Uh, you want to invest so you can sell it to somebody else. Whatever the case may be, it's going to attract a lot of investment. Now, that's good. Now, when you talk about countries like the US that says, well, we're going to have a Green New Deal, right? And we're not talking about the we're not talking about uh, A.O. Crazy or Bernie Sanders kind of stuff, right? Oh, well, we're going to invest in our infrastructure. That's like that's like Dubai saying, well, we're going to invest in our infrastructure and we're going to, re you know, redo the Burj Khalifa. Well, if you redo the Burj Khalifa, you're not going to create any more value. You might, sure, 
uh, increase the value relative to what you put into it because you modernized it, but you're not making a new Burj Khalifa. You understand? You're not creating that same economic uh, impact. So the amount of money that you're going to spend relative to the investment that you're going to get back is not the same. Okay, that's very important to understand. That money that you invested in modernizing the Burj Khalifa on a debt to GDP, if you will, think of it like that, right? How much investment you're going to get back, how much economic growth you're going to get back relative to the amount of money that you're going to invest modernizing it is going to be subpar. You're going to see that GDP is actually falling relative to the amount of money. It's the same exact thing uh, that we are witnessing in the United States. Uh, that you're getting more and more and more stimulus and less and less and less and less GDP. And I've shown this a million times. So while nominally you may increase the amount uh, per unit is sold in the Burj Khalifa because it's modernized, yes, the, the, the real uh, impact in the economy is not going to be anywhere near that nominal uh, improvement relative to the amount of money created. So when I hear the perma bulls, I hear the incubator economists, and we're going to stimulate, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do the Green New Deal, and da, 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 da. but to me, it doesn't make any sense, because this is all I think about. It's just another Burj Khalifa that's already existing that they're going to upgrade and make pretend that it's new. No, it's not the same thing. It's the same thing as repaving a road, right? The benefit of the road was that you're going to connect two cities and you're going to make it faster for people to travel in between. You're going to have more commerce. You're going to have more trade. You're going to have more everything. What if you repave it? Are, are you going to increase the commerce and the trade and so forth? Of course not, right? You might marginally increase because people can drive faster because you improved the road uh, thanks to pavement, pa paving it, but you're not going to meaningfully increase, you're not going to have the same impact as when you first build the road. So I bring you back to this chart again. Forget that it's airlines, forget all these things. Again, I can convince someone that when passenger uh, count falls, stock prices fall, right? And think of passengers as value. And then you look at the price and then, you know, value reflects, price reflects value eventually. The amount of stimulus that was given to the airlines is not going to make a difference uh, into the value of the airlines. You may successfully keep the prices artificially high, uh, especially now. Well, vaccine came out, it's up 12%. Well, is there a 12% improvement in passengers? No, no. Well, it's a forward-looking indicator, okay, but you're not going to get that growth until you get the passengers back, until you get the value higher. After the shutdown was over, look what happened. Stock prices jumped. Oh, it's over. We're going back to normal. And then what happened? Boom, they crashed, right? Yeah, value increased, and, it, 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 you know, there was an improvement, but not enough to sustain a, an, an airline, right? So think as... Airline bailouts, the same thing as printing money, right? It's a, it's a stimulus. Yeah, but the stimulus is not going to change the value of the economy. You can print whatever you want. It's not going to change the fundamental economy. The value of the economy is not going to improve. So having said that, to answer the first question uh, Uche uh, was asking, will there be economic growth as a result of forgiving student loans? And the answer I gave was no. Technically, it will, but fundamentally, it will not. Okay? It's the same way, because remember, it's a small portion of the population. It's not the entire population. It's the same thing when you saw oil go from $150 all the way down to 20 and then balance out somewhere around 50 Was there meaningful economic growth? The answer is no. You didn't see any of that. Well, what about when you... Uh, got interest rates down to zero after the great financial crisis, okay? Was there, because obviously a lot of homeowners, they remortgaged their, their houses, right? Uh, the ones that were insolvent suddenly became solvent, and the ones that uh, never bought a home, they just refinanced, their debt payments went down, okay? So that's an increase of discretionary income. So did the GDP grow? 
And the answer is no, it was around 2%, right? No meaningful impact. How about tax cuts? Well, we're going to give tax cuts. We're going to give tax. Okay, great. 2017, we got tax cuts. Did you see a meaningful growth to GDP? And the answer is no. So you can see that there's no evidence anywhere in the economy that suggests forgiving student loan debts is going to have a meaningful impact in the economy, the economic growth, right? You, you can understand that. The average student loan is somewhere between ten dollars and $25,000. Let's make it fifteen. dollars Let's make it $135 per month. What happens? What happens? You get an extra $135. Yeah, but these are the people that have a, a college degree and they get paid more than ever than the non-college degree people. And as a percentage of their income, that $135 is a smaller portion than it would be for somebody that's making minimum wage. And on top of that, always remember that those who have student loans, uh, it's a smaller percentage of the population, right? Now, and now is, is a key word. We are in the now economy. What is the now economy? The now economy is that I want my money now. <laughs> I want to make money now. I don't want to go buy a bond, wait 10 years, and make 5 6%. I don't want that. I want my money now. So what happens? The bonds have turned into essentially stocks. That the bond price appreciation is more important than long-term investment. Right? It's the now economy. Give me money now. The bond prices have to keep going up now so I can get paid now so I can get my money. And that's problematic. That's end game stuff, right? When interest rates can only go one way down and they can't go back up, that is that is a path to destruction. It's, it's like being in a Lamborghini and saying how cool you are. You floored it. You're in sixth gear, right? Top speed. And now you need to brake and it doesn't work. That's how I view it. You're cool as shit. You're in a fucking red heart Lamborghini. You look fantastic. Right? It's doing what it's supposed to do, go as fast as it possibly can in six gear, fucking doing, you know, 250 miles per hour, right? 300 kilometers or whatever, right? Everything is wonderful, but you can't push it on the brakes. Well, now it becomes a problem, right? You're not so cool suddenly. And uh, you went from, uh, you know, doing what the car is doing, it's supposed to do to not being able to do what it's supposed to do because you're going to crash. So again, that extra 135 uh, dollars is not going to have a meaningful impact in the productive economy. It will, however, pay the savers, right? They're going to get their money, cash. Well, it's the same thing as, Q as QE, right? Give me your bond. I'll give you cash at the market rate right now, which is higher than when it was issued. Okay. And go out and buy some more bonds and bid up price on yourself. So then I can come in and buy, I, the central bank, can come back and buy it at a higher price and we'll just keep doing this uh, to infinity. Well, you can't do that to infinity because the more you print, the more you need to print. The more you QE, the more you need to QE. The more you need to have helicopter money, money the more you're going to have to do helicopter money. It's a one-way street and it doesn't work. You got to have the brakes. It's the same thing as MMT says. Well, we can print to inflation. Well, that's stupid. Well, I can eat until I don't gain weight. Well, that, <laughs> yeah, but you're overeating. You can't continuously print money to infinity. It doesn't make sense because what are you going to do when inflation comes? Impose austerity, cut spending, right? Raise taxes. Well, what is that going to do? It's, it's going to destroy everything because the now economy, the now, pay me now, it's going to start to sell off the bonds. If you start selling off the bonds, that's going to make interest rates rise. That's going to make credit uh, more expensive. That's going to reduce the amount of credit that people can, can go out. If you do that, then what's going to happen? Because remember, right? Deficits are a one-way street. <laughs> they don't, it's, not, it's not like, oh, you know, it's an ecosystem feedback loop, right? It's a one-way street. So then what happens is all the money starts to drain out of the productive economy and the economy starts to implode. You go into a deflationary spiral. So while it sounds great to the everyday Joe Schmo that, hey, we can print to infinity. I mean, I'm sorry, we can print to uh, inflation and then, you know, we'll take care of it. Well, no, you won't take care of it. Because 
the oversimplification that that sounds great great has consequences and those consequences when you just kind of omit them uh, they come back to bite you in the ass and that's why Minsky says stability is inherently destabilizing right when you keep reducing that risk you keep reducing the risk you keep reducing the risk eventually that risk is going to blow up in your face and then you can't reduce it anymore right everything just goes you know haywire it goes chaos comes so that's one next question vaccines so the vaccine is here we okay that, that's the problem and as long as you know we, we fix covid now we're, we're, you know we're okay no no that's not the way it works when an economy an economy is like a heart okay when you suffer a heart attack you may be stabilized and you're okay but the heart muscle tissue has been damaged there's damage and the longer that you're suffering from a heart attack the more muscle that is damaged the the harder it is to get the heart back uh, uh, running properly yeah but the economy you know uh, is different than a heart well yeah uh, eventually it will improve but and people talk about cycles all the time but there's a cycle of cycles right there's a point where you've done so much damage to that economy uh, that you're, you're you're living off past glory and that past glory is going to bite you in the ass if you if you just accept it to be uh, as never changing that it will always be great that it will always be that's not the case for example the US used to be 40 percent of global GDP uh, an unimaginable size right not so much because we were bigger we were just bigger than everybody else everybody else was much smaller okay so that 40 percent has over time shrunk down to 25 24 23 percent of GDP granted we're only five percent of the global population but the economy from where we used to be and where we are today is vastly different the dollar was the world reserve currency and it was the only game in town now that's not the case right you got the euro you got the Canadians you got uh, Japan you got Australia you got New Zealand yeah they're much much sm smaller but all of them cumulatively have chipped away at the dominance of the dollar it's still 60 percent of of all trade in the world for sure it's king dollars king I'll always say that until it's not there's a point that it won't be right especially as the one the one now is only 1.7 or 1.9 percent of uh, uh, of floating currencies in the world but that's going to increase over time so this is to answer the, the third question uh, that I don't believe in China that I don't do this and China this and China debt and China whatever yeah well whatever look it's very simple uh, China doesn't have to be 5% of the global population producing 25% of global GDP okay uh, they don't because they're four times bigger than the United States so they only have to be 25% uh, of, of, of their abilities to match the United States. Now, I've also, I've also said that it's not necessarily bad that China grows. It's not a bad thing. So long as you can sell one iPhone to every Chinaman, right? At $1,000 a pop. That's 1.4 billion <laughs> iPhones. That's more than enough to, to make us rich. Okay, so... Uh, from one extreme to the other uh, there's a happy medium somewhere uh, provided that you can have that free trade going if China's gonna be protectionism and you know we're gonna steal all your shit and you know and then when you want to do business over here we're not gonna let you well that's a problem right that's a very big problem and that's why I wasn't against uh, Trump uh, having a uh, a trade war not necessarily war but a trade um, negotiations right like dude before you get too big we need to deal with this and that's true and it's not only true for the United States it's true for the rest of the world but the way the buffoon went about it is completely stupid in the end I mean, you saw it the guy is a, he's a moron he didn't know what he was doing his negotiators didn't know he, what he was doing he was trying to bully them that's never going to work that's not negotiations you're not going to go insult them <laughs> and they're going to agree with you right the great deal maker so you know 
everything has a reason and if it's done correctly everybody can benefit the Chinese can benefit by becoming uh, not so much producers because let's be fair that they are starting to slowly price themselves out of the market because their their cost of living is rising there's a bigger middle class okay so you see countries like uh, Vietnam uh, Philippines and, and peripheral uh, Asian countries they're doing better but again look at the trade deal that China just made right we're out of every single trade deal known to man we hate NATO we hate our allies we hate fucking everybody we just love uh, uh, North Korea we love Putin and we love uh, uh, Erdogan I mean you know <laughs> this is not something that's that's sustainable so let's you know let, let's be um, realistic here okay let me show you something here about world trade because there's so much garbage out there that is that, that is talked about world trade world trade and, and again it comes back to this theme that there's limits to everything everything has limits you look at world trade and let's just focus on this for a second okay what you'll see is that since the 70s world trade has increased steadily and then we come up to 2008 and we have a very big collapse in world trade we recover and then flatten out so we can say based on evidence that 60 percent of GDP is about a limit doesn't mean it can't be more it can always be more but as a percentage of GDP about 60 lim 60 percent is, is a limit maybe it's 68 64 whatever the numbers but we're reaching a limit in terms of global trade and again this is to answer a COVID question right oh the vac vaccine is here you know blah 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 yeah we're still on that I'm just taking you somewhere else and bringing you back together uh, everything right so we saw in 2008 global trade collapse look what happened here all right so here's here's 2008 2009 we had that collapse right there okay you can see it clearly and then we started to see an improvement and it took about two years to get global trade back up again okay it didn't come back instantly so let's look at what happened in 2014 15 and 16 and then what happened in 18 19 and 20 okay first of all note that when we collapsed in 2008 we were 60 percent GDP right look what, what happened to corporate profits right they dropped we went into a recession then we recovered okay here's a recovery right in here right you see it here's a recovery all right the corporate profits went up went from about 1.5 trillion per quarter to about 2 trillion so there was about a 25 percent increase or a little bit more uh in corporate profits all right good now oops i almost made a mistake here all right so then since 2012 what have corporate profits done nothing what has global trade done nothing nothing okay so you see that corporate profits in the United States are really dependent on global trade again it's not something that I think it's not something that I just come up with well I like this story forget about this this has a, let the data tell you what's going on I've <coughs> often said that in 2014 15 16 something happened there was a technical recession granted the stock market didn't crash but there was lo large drawdowns right look what happened to global trade during that time period look what happened to corporate profits during that period okay it's something that's repetitive it's not something that is based on vague hunches and feelings let's take a look and see what happened to the stock market okay look what happened to the stock market it went nowhere it went nowhere all right so what about the rest what about all of this what about all this wonderful growth 
in the stock market. Well, did world GDP meaningfully grow during that time period? And the answer is not relative to stocks. So let me show you. Let, let's go back in time, okay? And we'll take we'll take the world average, which the growth rate has been around 3.6, right? About three three to four percent the, the global, right? And then we start going into 2019, and you start seeing that the global growth starts to fall. When did oil peak out? 2014. Where where was 2014? 2014 was right about here. Okay. Global growth was slowing. And it continued to slow. Doesn't matter if the stock market went higher. The growth started to fall. And then going into the end, into 2020, right? Things started getting worse. And then finally we hit COVID and everything, you know, the shit hit the fan. But again, if you're going to give me the argument that uh, stocks don't care about economics and blah, blah, blah. It's true. They don't have to agree with economics for a period of time, but eventually they all come back to reality. You cannot have global growth at around three, four percent. Okay. And the stock market going up 34% every, uh, every year. You cannot have 33 day recessions <laughs> in the stock market. In, a, in an economy that's, that's the worst since 1929, the Great Depression. Right now, emerging markets are forecasted to shrink 3.3%. You have advanced economies that are going to shrink by 5.8%, and then the world is going to shrink by 4.4%. Now, do you guys remember that I said you need something between 2 and $5 trillion of uh, uh, global GDP to, to be wiped out in order to go into a recession. You guys remember that? Right? Was I right? Of course I was. Not because Nick Hyonas came up with it, because he, he just made shit up in his head. Okay? It's the way it's always been. So when we look at the global GDP, it was about 65, right in here. 65%, I'm sorry, 65 trillion worldwide, with a 5% reduction. You're somewhere around 80. Okay, we dropped to about 80 trillion, so we lost about 5%. What did the stock market do now? It's almost at 100 trillion, while the global GDP is at 80 from 85. Not sustainable. While the stock market hypothetically can continue to go higher, it cannot go higher without consequences. What are, what are those consequences? That there's a devaluation in the dollar. That there is uh, much higher unemployment, much more printing, much more helicopter, much more QE, much more destructive um, economics. Again, we're going to go back to Philippines. You're going to look at the Philippine stock market uh, relative in dollars. Okay, This is an ETF. Uh, so you look at it and it's fairly stable. You look at the currency, fairly stable. Now I'm going to compare the same thing uh, with Turkey. Here is the same exact stock market and it only goes back to 2009 on the ETF, so I can only go back to 2009, but it doesn't matter, right? The Turkish uh, index relative to lira is going straight up. I've shown this before. While in dollars, it's gone straight down. Completely different stories. So if you invested in uh, the Turkish uh, index in lira, you're saying, oh, look, I'm, I'm doing great. <laughs> in reality, based on the rest of the world, you're losing your ass. Okay, you've lost your ass. And how much of your ass have you lost? Well, we can measure that. You've lost 77% of the value of your money. And here is the Turk here's the US dollar vers versus the Turkish lira. Okay? You can see why. And I can reverse this as well. Okay. You've lost your ass. So sure, the stock market can go uh, can go up, but not without consequences. It's not the way it works. Remember, there is always value and there's always price. 
right? And it's not just the stock market price, right? It's the stock market price in that currency relative to the rest of the world. So when you look at the U.S. and you look at the S&P going from the bottom left to the top right, and then you look at the currency, it's more or less flat, but you can make an argument that it's going from the top left to the bottom right. Well, you know, how much of the stock market rising is it due to uh, monetary inflation, right? That's something that you have to you, you have to factor in. And at what point does the stock market continue to go higher, right, and, and sacrifice the dollar? Again, you know, you can't, you got to think of GDP. You got to think of the wealth of the country. You got to think of the stock market, uh, how it's influenced with money printing, QEs, helicopter money. You have to factor in the currency. You have to take all that and then compare that to the rest of the world and see what what story it's telling you. There are always limits. Do you think I could have convinced anybody right here that the dollar was overvalued? Or how about here? Could I convince anybody that the dollar was overvalued? Could I know if the dollar was overvalued? Nobody can know anything about the future. I can only tell you that there are limits. You don't know where those limits are. You need to take your risk reward. You need to assess that information, not with memes and not with, well, you know, the U.S. is great since 1776. Well, that's great. Bravo. What, what good does that do me? It doesn't do me any good. If you are relying on a economy improving based on uh, stimulus, helicopter money, green deals, rebuilding what's already built, uh, uh, forgiveness of debt uh, to college, if you're relying on that, you're in trouble. You are in big, big trouble. If you think that a vaccine is going to suddenly make the U.S. go back to where it was, well, then you have to start doing some math. That when we were in January 2020, where we were in terms of corporate earnings per share, the earnings yield, sorry, right, it was about 4.5, okay? And that's when everything was 3.4% unemployment, everything was firing on all cylinders, quote-unquote, whatever. Okay, the stock market since then has increased, right? How much has it increased? Let's take the NASDAQ, which is the market leader. And and here is where we were at the height, all right? 9,700, 9, and we've gone up 28%, right? So we have to re now reduce the value of the earnings per share by 28%. That makes the earnings yield at 3.3%. Even if everything went back to normal and everything was fine, based on where price is today, it would be up to 3.3%. On a historical basis, we are so far behind, below, so far below where we need to be. That makes the stock market so e extremely, extremely expensive uh, relative to the economy. There are always limits. Again, it doesn't mean that the, uh, the, the stock market can't go up. It's not what I'm saying. It's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that if it does, there's going to be other consequences to pay for, right? That are not tied to the, the, the price of, uh, uh, of the stock market. You're going to have dollar devaluation, right? You're going to have negative interest rates. It's going to destroy banks. You, you think that's going to get people back to work? No. Look at Venezuela, right? Their stock market is up 1,700% for the year. So what? Their currency has completely collapsed. And again, I'm not saying hyperinflation, but I'm telling you there's consequences. So while we're saying that why not, why can't Apple go to $3 trillion instead of, you know, whatever it is, $2 trillion now? Because that's another 33% increase in Apple. And if it's 33% increase in Apple, that's a 33% increase in the stock market again. If it's a 33% increase in the stock market again, okay, well, what do we got to do to the earnings? We've got to re reduce it by another 33%, right? Where does that take us? Well, that takes us exactly where we are right now. Uh, in terms of earnings yield. Fair enough. 
what's interest rate have to be? Right? It has to be zero or below. Right? <laughs> not necessarily, but right? So if it's not, if it's not at zero or below, then where, where does interest rates have to be uh, in bonds? Higher. Well, if it's higher, that's going to put pressure on stocks. Where does that put the stock market? Lower. You can't, you can't have both ways. You can't have it always. But the vaccine. But the vaccine. What good is a fucking vaccine to me? <laughs> Who's going to vaccinate the stock market? Who's going to vaccinate the economy? You can't do it. <laughs> You're at limits. You're going to go, what, from 68% uh, of GDP consumption to what? What are you going to go to? Where is it? Where are you going to go? 80% consumption? 75? Where are you going to go? You see, you, you, you got to be aware of these things. You got you to gotta think about these things. Right. Uh, last question. Uh, okay, so we wiped out now suddenly, more for political reasons, this excess money that was sitting around uh, that was supposed to be used for COVID and wasn't. So all these lending facilities now are going to go away. Well, they were supposed to go away on December 31st. That's a, Yeah, that's the way you, read, you wrote it, but it doesn't mean that's what you were going to do, right? Uh, so now this money is gone. Uh, there's no stimulus that is on the horizon. Um, if you think a vaccine that is just going to magically make everything, you know, go back to normal, it's, that's not going to happen. So you can sit here and, and, and think whatever you want, but it's not going to happen. Uh, if if you want to be fooled, go, go to these incubators and uh, experts and they'll tell you about, oh, look, you know, it's a V-shaped recovery and all that stuff. And, and knock yourself out, go out, buy the stock market, uh, do whatever it is that you want to do. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But I am just here to let you know to be aware of these things, okay? That when you remove this excess cash that was never in the economy, it doesn't make a difference, okay? It doesn't make a difference. You know when it's going to make a difference? When they realize that the economy is fucked and then they need that cash, and now they have to go back and negotiate, negotiate it on a political level. And God knows how that's going to work out. <laughs> Good luck with that. And then you're going to see what reality is. Because if the stock market starts to crash, and I don't know if it will because I, I think they're smart enough not to crash it because they know there's not going to be any backstop. If the, if the stock market does crash, who's going to bail it out? Trump? Good luck with that. So who's going to backstop risk? The Fed with more QE? Good luck with that. Take interest rates below 0.6. See what happens. Okay. You see, there's a confluence of stupidity, limits, uh, economics that is outside of a spreadsheet or a thesis or a, you know political economic theory. A confluence of things that can come together, blow everything up, and if COVID was any kind of indication of how they're going to deal with it, then we're screwed. The market is screwed. And we go back to what I said on February 2nd, right? That you're going to shut down 80% of the global GDP, okay? Um, that you're it's not COVID in of itself. It's the social economic impact that matters. That's what's going to, 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 to create the problems. It's forget about COVID. COVID can be dealt with. It's not about COVID. It's about the damages that COVID does. And as I say, will government stop the precautionary measures that will cause the most harm and risk it? I doubt it. They're not going to do what they're supposed to do. I knew that back on February 2nd. They're not going to do what they're supposed to do. They're not going to take the precautionary measures. They're idiots. They're going to sit here and negotiate with a with a zero sum, with a binary zero sum game virus. It doesn't care. Virus doesn't care. Well, I don't like it the way it is. Uh, can we negotiate this? Can we partially open up? Can we, you know, 
a little bit partially shut down and partially re-shut down. And think about it. Five weeks, all we had to do was to shut down completely. I mean completely, like real deal. I mean, Taiwan, China style. Shut it down five weeks. And then that's it. That's it. Virus is gone. And if it's not gone, it's so so minimal. You, you cock-blocked it. You wait for the vaccine. Everything goes back to normal. Do you think they would do something like that? No, because they got to negotiate it. They think vague hunches and feelings are are, are, are negotiable with a, with a virus. Virus doesn't care, right? So what what have we done? Nine months we've learned nothing. It's the flu. It's a liberal hoax. It's whatever the fuck it is, right? And we're up, we're up, we're in, on fire now. We're, there's I don't know how many businesses are fucking out of business. Twenty five, thirty million people are unemployed. Heart damage to the economy. Muscle tissue damaged it will take a long time to recover it's not going to be bloop, we're back you think we're going to go back to 68 percent consumption i don't think so what i said on february 2nd is what happened and is what i maintain to this day tell me all the vaccines that you want i don't care okay i've been right for nine months price is not going to dictate my analysis uh price of the stock market is not going to dictate my analysis it's not going to change it. The analysis is what it is. And the results in the economy are very clear. Don't sit here and point to me to short-term isolators. Don't sit here and tell me about, oh, vaccines and, oh, stimulus and all. That's garbage. It's garbage. What did I say here? Global trade uh, in the economy were not doing so hot prior to the virus. And they weren't. That's why central banks were cutting rates. Like crazy, repos, not QE, remember that, right? I mean, I don't know how, how much simpler, again, it has nothing to do with what I think or what I feel or whatever. If I can't point it to you, then it's garbage. And lastly, I'm going to show you another economy that didn't stimulate, that didn't do this and didn't do that. They, they shut down as well. They did everything, whatever. Okay, and I'm going to show you again. Look at Ukraine. This is the stock market. This is when I, when I did a special on Ukraine back in 2016. I said, this is a great economy. This is a place that you want to invest because things are only going to improve. There's very low uh, private debt. Okay, uh, things are looking up for the Ukraine. Uh, we're seeing passenger... Uh, 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 flows increase in the in their airports. There was a lot of positive news. Since then, the stock market in the Ukraine is up 154%. Okay, sure, we had a pullback now. Okay, now let's go to the currency. Since 2016, what has the currency done? It hasn't lost and it hasn't gained. It's been steady. So not only did you get all the gains in the stock market, right? You had a stable currency, more or less. The only reason that this ever occurred was because of that war with Russia. That's it. Not because the, the economy in of itself uh, was, was not good. Okay. So again, my analysis back then in 2016, going forward to 2020, even with COVID, even with no stimulus, no helicopter money, no QE, all, all that stuff. Look how much better Ukraine has performed um, than uh, the U.S. And when I say better, I'm saying without stimulus, without all this helicopter money and QEs. And all, look how they performed. Right? So remember, all this garbage about, oh, we're stimulating for the people was never about the people. It was always about the investment. Right? Backstopping risk for the stock market. That's it. All right? So, again, the analysis works. It's solid. Learn how to do it. Be your own analyst. Look at things pragmatic. Don't listen to, I heard this guy said this and that guy said that. And, you know, you know, back in the day it was like, well, the, you know, this company is tied to China. Oh, that's all you had to say. Oh, it's tied to China. I'm going to go buy that stock because it has exposure to China. Right? Remember that? China had nothing to do with it. 
Jim Cramer, CNBC. Oh, you know, these companies, you know, they're multinationals and they're tied to China. That's all you had to say and the stock market would go up. Right? So, be smart. Learn how to do this on your own. No need for me. Understand where the limits are. Back test them. If I can't point it, you can't go and verify it for yourself. Don't listen to me. All right. Um, so we'll talk more again this week. Have a great night, and I'll talk to you soon. And please don't forget to like and subscribe. And uh, come down to patreon.com slash macro. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye-bye.